Okie dokie. Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whoever you are, wherever you are. This is Dr. Patrick Lockwood coming back to you live. I hope that you all are well. Um, sorry for the delay, just working on a technical issue with the microphone here, but I think I got it all fixed. Um, headphones are back because I want to hear what's going on and how I sound in real time. So if you don't like it, you'll get over it. So, uh, yeah, how are you all doing? Hope you all are well. I've been reconsidering a lot uh, based upon feedback I've been getting. And, you know, I think it's time to kind of really, really, really get, um, I think it's time to really take cer certain things seriously. And today's talk is definitely going to be um, a little more on the serious side, a little less playful. I'll see if I can work some humor in there. Uh, but generally speaking, I think this is a more serious talk because the topics at hand are important. So today I want to talk about the concept of critical discourse analysis. And I want to talk about how that applies to modern kind of vigilante groups like Black Lives Matter and Antifa and all those good people, um, which is no different in my mind than the KKK and um any other kind of white supremacist or reactionary group on the kind of conservative side of the aisle. Um, totalitarian is totalitarian, violent is violent, ideological is ideological. So um, they're just the topics du jour. Uh, I don't care one way or the other. And then uh, I wanna talk about how this kind of activates a more tribalistic way of thinking and feeling in the world. So these are the three topics and I'm gonna try and do my best to weave them all together. So. If I don't achieve that, let me know. Um, if I come off as sounding somehow uh, not thoughtful or bigoted or anything of that nature, please also let me know because the goal is to try and do this in as matter of fact a way as I possibly can. And I know that these topics are not necessarily simple and they're not necessarily unidimensional and they're not necessarily um, unemotional. So I'm gonna do my best to be unemotional about them and I will probably fail, but just going to try. So before we get into the gist of the topics, um, specifically critical discourse analysis, I'm going to give you a number of caveats and acknowledgments beforehand so that if anyone does comment and say, I don't know what I'm talking about, they can just uh, go back to this part in the video where I acknowledge that I don't necessarily know what I'm talking about. So. Three caveats specifically. One, I am perfectly aware, not minimally, not partially, not somewhat, but perfectly aware that I am not a communications, linguistics, or sociology scholar. I do not have any formal training. I have not spent years studying these topics. So I'm perfectly aware of that. And I'm going to own that up front, just like I did in my book. Fear problem. Go get it. It's worth it. 10 bucks on Amazon. Mascot books, my website, go get it. I did the same thing there. I'm not a scholar of these particular, you know, disciplines, etc. So I'm not going to claim to be one. Um, but I'm going to claim, or not but, and I'm going to do my best to try and articulate what I think I know and how it might be useful to maybe take a different approach towards this particular kind of discipline of study. Well, that's the first caveat. The second caveat is I'm perfectly aware that I am not deeply acquainted with the literature. However, just so everyone knows, I've been looking through dozens of abstracts over the last week, and I've read probably at least 30 papers up to this point, because I have all sorts of free time. Um, but I wanted to like give an honest representation of what I think I know and what I think I'm understanding about this particular topic, critical discourse analysis. analysis. Um, and finally, kind of following that, the final caveat is this. I understand that what I'm about to talk about here and what I'm about to say is not a comprehensive review or critique. I am simply trying to open a dialogue between myself and whoever comments or is a researcher in these topics, um, if they want to comment, if they want to fight, if they want to discuss, debate, whatever. 
I'm just trying to open a dialogue because I think you hear a lot of famous or popular people like, you know, Sam Harris and, you know, Jordan Peterson and others talk about this postmodernist approach to things, etc. And one of the sources of this postmodernist like rhetoric is not necessarily in the philosophy departments, but it's actually in like the linguistics, communications and sociology departments. So, or as Jordan Peterson often describes them as the humanities departments. So what I would like to do is I'd like to talk about like the root of the problem, so to speak, um, to maybe see if we can address how our critical thinking skills and how academia became at one point a very useful, I would say very useful, um, a very useful, um, sorry, microphone issues. What I would describe as a very useful set of, you know, analytical tools in critical discourse analysis, but it turned into a very serious kind of, um, how would you describe it? A very serious, gosh, it could turn into a weapon. They went from tools to weapons. And that's what I wanna talk about is how critical discourse analysis and all the tools within it went from being a set of tools to a set of weapons. Just no differently than a wrench can help you take, you know, the lugs off of a car wheel and like change a tire. It can also be used to bludgeon someone. And I think that's what's happening with critical discourse analysis. Um, but I could be wrong. Maybe I'm just out of my depth because I just haven't read enough. Maybe I'm just kind of caught up in the hype of all these public intellectuals who are kind of bashing the postmodernist critical discourse uh, way of thinking. So just stick with me. It's a little dry, but I'm going to try and get through it and make it somewhat entertaining if I can. So basically speaking, academics and the communications departments, critical theory departments, sociology departments, etc., cetera, um, at di different universities all over the world, especially in Western countries in Europe and the United States, um, have, from what I can tell, been kind of destroying and tearing apart history, science, critical thinking, and other forms of public discourse through a process called critical discourse analysis, or CDA. So for the purposes of the remainder of this talk, I'm going to call it CDA. So I hope that's clear to everyone. So CDA is part of what most people would now call kind of a regressive belief system that history is best viewed through the uh, lens of oppressor, oppressee, oppressor, victim, and, you know, painted with a brush of oppressor, victim. So this is the, the in my mind, this set of studies is the um, birthplace of the victim oppressor narrative that has been extremely popular since the late 90s up until the present moment where it's like on fire in universities and elsewhere. So what's the history on this? Where does this come from? So from what I can tell, academics and institutions around like the late 1980s uh, started implementing and using this kind of philosophical and analytical approach to look at different speeches and books and texts of various kinds to figure out how and in what ways and in, in what to what degree does the way that the speaker or the writer reinforce narratives of power, privilege, and classism, basically. So how do they either prescribe a narrative of power and privilege, or how do they reinforce it and maintain it? So it's not necessarily to say that the speakers or the writers are creating a new narrative of power and privilege. It's just to say that we want to see how they already maintain or explain how they have power and privilege. And the goal of critical discourse analysis originally, from what I've read here, and I'm going to post lots and lots of links and citations in the uh, caption here. So you go take a look and you tell me if I'm full of shit. But basically, the goal was to critically evaluate the role of how we speak and how we write to create, maintain, and legitimize inequality, injustice, and oppression in society. And specifically, you are hoping to see using critical discourse analysis or CDA, how people and groups in positions of power have gained and maintained that power by oppressive means. 
So the focus is really on oppression of, of despite inequality, despite injustice, oppression became the, the hallmark as the as CDA became more popular. Originally, it was really more kind of an objective look at inequality and injustice and oppression. And then it became really focused on oppression as time went by, or at least that from my reading of the literature since the 80s up until last year, all the articles talked about it that way, all the review articles I read. And just so everyone's clear, I think it's important that we have a common definition of what it means to oppress someone. And I looked around at different online dictionaries, etc. And basically speaking, to oppress means to enforce prolonged, cruel, or unjust treatment or control. That's all that oppress means. So it's prolonged, cruel. So it stays for a long time, prolonged, cruel, or unjust, so unfair or nasty treatment or control. So unfair or cruel. Now, most of us, when we hear the word oppressed, we don't necessarily think unfair. We typically think on the cruel side of it, which is why it's such an emotionally laden word, because in common parlance, we've really taken oppress and oppressor to mean more you know, aggressive and cruel and less about the unfair. We're kind of forgetting the unfair side of it because um, I think we get caught up in the emotional cruelty of the experience where so-and-so is being oppressed or such group is being oppressed by such other group. Um, and that's what's caught fire in the academic world is they're not really focusing on the power imbalances and the degrees of fair and unfair. They're really focusing on the degree to which it's just an oppressor, oppressee victim kind of cruelty narrative. And I think that's one of the problems. Um, so there's that. Um, uh, what else can I say? So let me see what I can do here if I can. Um, okay. So what does the literature basically say? Or, or I'm going to pull out what the critiques of critical discourse analysis say. Um, so I've already defined critical discourse analysis using modern definitions by modern researchers. I didn't just, this is not my definition of critical discourse analysis. The authors like Van Leeuwen and Van Dyck, who are like big, big, big writers in CDA studies, describe you know, critical discourse analysis as a method of critically evaluating the crucial role of text and talk in creating, maintaining, and legitimizing inequality, injustice, and oppression in society. That is their definition, almost word for word. I just made it a little more common parlance so it didn't sound so, uh, what's, what's, it didn't sound so like formal and academic. Um, so how do people, how do the critics of CDA kind of describe it? So Breeze in 2011 described uh, critical discourse analysis as more orthodoxy, less analytical theory. So it's less scientific, more religious. And that's in the Journal of Pragmatics, their quarterly publication. Um, I've seen other critics call it a radical academic ideology. So there's a critique of critic CDA by Widdowson in 1995 that explained how there is, quote unquote, a good deal of conceptual confusion in the field of critical discourse analysis. One example is the uncertainty of the scope of description, which is reflected in the ambiguity of the term function and the failure to distinguish between text and discourse. Another is the tendency to equate social and linguistic theory with political commitment, which raises the question of the relationship between analysis and interpretation. It is argued that this confusion makes suspect the theory. So basically, if I were to put that into more common parlance terms, what Whittleson's critique is that, you know, we don't have perfectly defined what this theory is about and how we use it and how we kind of conceptually go about things. And secondarily, um, they're conflating political motives with commitment to act on them. Because there's a lot of literature in the psychology world that shows for a fact that you might hold X belief, but your tendency to act on X belief is actually some distance away. So you're not quite likely to act on X belief, especially if it's a radical belief, typically speaking. The average person, now there obviously are subgroups who act on radical beliefs, like 
There are a number of bombings that have happened recently of critical terrorist attacks, etc. You know, those that particular small subgroup of people with radical beliefs will absolutely act on them. But the average person is not typically going to act on radical beliefs, according to most psychology research. So that's one of the problems, the critiques of CDA, according to Widdowson in 1995. And I'll post that in the caption. Um, and here's a great quote from an article by Stevens, Warens, and DeBolt, which was published last year, um, that tried to use critical discourse analysis to talk about big data. Um, so they said, and I quote, metaphors of selecting and constructing data illustrate another political message, framing big data as limited. We conclude that work in the critical interpretive discourse has not broadly infiltrated the medical domain. Ways to better integrate aspects of the discourse in the healthcare system domain are urgently needed. So that's a little bit concerning because we're talking about how a, an analytical technique is going to infiltrate the medical domain. And they're also talking about constructing data. Now, it is true that different social scientists in particular are really good at manipulating data. And that's a huge problem for my profession and other professions in particular. Um, it's really sad how people do manipulate data in the hard sciences and in the soft sciences that I'm a part of. And that needs to stop like ASAP. But I don't think that you necessarily construct data. I don't think that that's a fair way of looking at it. Um, but it's just scary that, as that quote indicated, that they want to infiltrate, like they want to um, kind of seep into in kind of this really weird, slow, creepy way. And I don't know that that's a good thing. I think an open discussion about the utility of using CDA would be okay. I don't know that like seeping in is a good choice. So I think the goal is to kind of think about why these authors write this way. That's a very scary thing for me. So what I would recommend is maybe we think about that more critically before we start kind of trying to quote unquote infiltrate things. And there's another article I found from Stubbs, that's a great last name, in 1997, which I imagine has gone mostly ignored. Um, which stated that there have been numerous criticisms of CDA, ranging from they go looking in the wrong place for their answer, so it's not a very rigorous academic approach, to something like they are politically biased and they don't actually take a representative look at the literature, art, and research. And I quote from one of the originators named Fairclaw uh, of CDA. And here's the quote from the article. Major problems remain with critical linguistics. Demonstrations, like academic demonstrations, proofs, tend to be fragmentary, exemplificatory, and they usually take too much for granted in the way of method and of context. Nowadays, it seems that anything can count as discourse analysis. There is a danger of competing and uncontrolled methodologies drawn from a scatter of different models in the social sciences. So that's an important quote, and I'm gonna post a link to that article and the reference in the caption because it's important to think that the originators, one of the originators of this way of thinking and this way of critically analyzing text and society and ideas said, it's too broad. We need to have more specific definitions, more specific tools. Um, so that's a problem. And another article I found uh, in 2005 was reviewing the influence of critical discourse analysis in education or research and teaching. And they pointed out three basic critiques of CDA. So, one is that the political and social ideologies are read into the data, which doesn't make sense. The data is the data. Number two, that there is an imbalance between social theory on the one hand and linguistic theory and method on the other hand. So the problem with CDA, according to this review by Rogers, I don't know how to say, Malincrevu, Burks, Mosley, Gui, and Joseph, I, I don't know if I said that person's name right, I'm sorry, um, that essentially, there's a lot of social theory, but there's also a lot of linguistic theory, and you're trying to do too many things at once. Is it, we need to focus more on linguistics or more on social? And then finally, the third critique is that CDA is often divorced from the, con the context of what it was said, right? Because context is everything, right? Um, okay, what else? So, so far, I've pointed out just a number of, um, you know, articles that show that there are some methodological and philosophical limitations of this particular way of analyzing and looking at texts. 
And I think at this point, it's a problem, or in my mind, it's a problem that a methodology CDA with so many like department slots nowadays, there it's an ever growing um, kind of field um, across linguistics, communications, other departments all over every university, especially in Western society. And essentially it's gained a lot of power in the last 20 years, maybe even 30 years. So it's an incomplete and incoherent methodology according to all the critics, critics from people who actually study and use these methodologies. And again, I'm going to perfectly acknowledge that this is a biased reading of the literature, as in I focus just on the critics. I know there's benefit, right? And I'll talk about that here in a minute. But just according to the critics, this is a problem. So what I think is important here is to acknowledge that maybe this ever-growing, more powerful way of looking at language, text, and all that stuff that's not very well thought out, that's not very well organized, that's not actually, as uh, the one author said, um, that political and social ideologies are read into the data. It's like fortune telling with text and talk. You can't know, right? So like if you were to listen to me talk in any of my videos, you would not be able to actually understand what political or social beliefs I hold because I basically, stay the hell away from politics. I talk about psychological concepts as much as I humanly can, but you don't ever hear me say I'm pro-guns or pro-abortion or pro-gay marriage or anything of that nature, right? You basically don't hear me talk about any of that crap. So you shouldn't be able to read or even infer what my political beliefs are, what side of the aisle, etc. I'm on, right? But if you use CDA, you can take bits and pieces back to the critique that it's fragmentary. You can take bits and pieces and string them together and come up with a, you know, an interpretation of what I think. But that's not the truth of what I think. You'd actually have to ask me straightforwardly, what do you believe about X? And then I will straightforwardly tell you what I believe about X. You can ask my friends, all the people who know me, I will straightforwardly tell you what I think. So there's that. Um, so what are the implications of using this overly broad, fragmentary, and kind of this, the way we use divining? Uh, what's the implication of this? Well, as you've heard Jonathan Haidt and Jordan Peterson say, we're kind of killing education, especially the humanities. And this is causing society to struggle with, you know, all sorts of issues that don't need to be struggled with. We're literally creating entire generations of workers and leaders who cannot be offended because they see the world through oppressor oppressy narratives. When in reality, you might just have an opinion that the other person doesn't like and you're not trying to oppress them. You're just trying to express an opinion that the other person doesn't like. There's no intention to oppress, but, oppre but intention does not matter in critical discourse analysis. Intention doesn't matter at all. It just matters what the main structure is and the meta structure is. It doesn't matter at all. Um, so that's a problem. We're basically creating a victimhood generation, as Jonathan Hyde talks about in his book. We need more anti-fragile, as Nicholas T Nassim Taleb would say. Um, furthermore, the second implication, as Jordan Peterson has said, kind of these postmodernists and the critical discourse analysts, etc., have a lot of logically inconsistent axioms. And they're very good at convincing believers that essentially speech is violence and oppression. And this is hugely problematic because then we face a giant socio-political issue about the concept of freedom of speech. So let's say, let's use a very theoretical example. And I'm going to say this one more time, but I'm going to take a drink first because I'm a little dehydrated from my run. Let's take a very challenging theoretical example and see how this becomes problematic, the whole speech is violence thing. So let's take the example of me, a psychologist, siding with someone like Stefan Molyneux or Charles Murray on their position about race and IQ, and say that we need to seriously consider the implications of IQ of different ethnic groups as a factor in political, economic, and other social decisions so that we can have a more harmonious society. 
because that's essentially their stance. So we can kind of spend and, and act better politically and legally. And, and if I say, as they have said, because IQ is more biologically driven, how much more? Is it 51, 49, 60, 40, 70, 30? We don't know. We don't know. I'd love to know, but we don't know. But if I say that, with some proof that environment can substantively change IQ, but there's always going to be a disparity among different groups of people, if I make that statement that I just made, that three or four part statement, then all of a sudden, because I'm some version of Caucasian-y, male privileged -y person, I now have assaulted those poor African Americans in the US by using racist, scientific, oppressive language. When in reality, all I did theoretically, again, this is theoretical, was make an academic assertion. I made an academic assertion with some political, socio-political ramifications. I could easily get fired. I could easily get sued. I could easily get harassed by Antifa morons, to be clear. I do believe that Stefan Molyneux or Charles Murray's position is a little more complicated than just X race ethnic group equals this average IQ. It, it's more complicated than that, but that's what people take away when they start talking. However, I don't think that's a helpful way of looking at the world, but that's a different theoretical discussion for a different interview or debate. Um, but the point of the matter is, if I make those statements, theoretically, I could get toasted, which is insane. By talking about a concept like IQ or ethnicity, just the mere fact of bringing up race could get me in horrific trouble, which is crazy. That's insane. It wouldn't be like I was out there shouting, you know, the K word or the N word or the F word or all sorts of, it's not like I would be using horrific, nasty, gross language. I would just be talking about academic concepts in a matter of fact way, and I could get in huge trouble for it, which is insane. It's terribly insane. So that's why the speech is as oppression or violence thing is terrible because it's causing unnecessary damage to all sorts of people. There's been this mass uh, banning of people on social media, Laura Loomer, da 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 da. All these people, Stefan Molyneux, are on the Southern Poverty Law Center's hate watch list, which is funny and insane. I hope the SPLC becomes bankrupt at some point um, because they're just not, they're not doing their job anymore. They're just kind of in their death throes, much like the mainstream media is. So hopefully they go out pretty, pretty peacefully and pretty soon. Um, so anyways, it's just insane that this is something that's happening. And then finally, another implication of the over-reliance on CDA uh, is that as Peter Bogosian and his colleagues have pointed out with their hoax papers, this is becoming much and much more dogmatic like a religion and less scientific or actually critical. It's not actually critical. It's actually harsh and dogmatic. They're like a terrorist organization, these CDA people, which is crazy because it's like, this is academia. There's nothing to fight for. You don't have to fight for your life. You don't have to fight for your right to speak in academia, or at least you shouldn't. So there's that. Um, and then another implication of, you know, the critical discourse analysis movement is that it removes the individuality of the individual. Because again, like the critiques above said, there's a lack of context. And as Van Dyck said in a 2006 paper, um, which I'll post in the caption, there are literally no private personal ideologies. That's when Van, Van Dyck, one of the bigger researchers and authors in this field, says there's there are no private personal ideologies, which is not true because, like I said earlier, there's a plethora of psychology and sociology literature that shows there's a giant distance between what you might believe and what you might actually act on. So um, another problem with that Van Dyck paper is he also defines, defines knowledge as like the beliefs of a community that are presupposed in its public discourses directed at the community at large as is the case for most discourses of mass media. But knowledge goes beyond belief, right? And a good example of this is, and I'm sure I'm gonna get all sorts of shit for saying this, but this is a good example. It's not just belief. Knowledge is not just a group belief. So gravity exists. That's a factual statement. Now, we don't believe in gravity. It is not my belief that the centripetal force of the Earth spinning round and round and round at a certain rate, et cetera, and my mass, and all that good kind of physics calculations, I don't believe, and therefore I'm still on this planet in this chair. You can change the name of gravity to toothbrush, and toothbrush is still the thing that's keeping me. It's the 
conceptual physics thing keeping me stuck to this chair. So toothbrush is still the centripetal force keeping my ass and your ass on this planet. Now, at least in the Van Dyck paper, he admits that grammar is a neutral force. So maybe, I mean, I don't know for how long that's going to be the case. I mean, the use of pronouns is becoming just like violence as well. So for now, grammar is safe, I guess. Um, and again, every language has different grammar because it speaks to different cultural needs. But that's probably racist and bigoted too. Um, so I'll post the link to that paper in the caption. More broadly, one of the problems with CDA gaining more and more popularity, it seems, is that it's causing a more societal chaos. Because now if I use certain words that are not even like hate speech, if I just use certain words, I'm now engaging in violence. Which is causing an egregious amount of chaos and fighting and stupidity, etc. Um, and you can see this with two very simple examples over the last, let's say, I'd say five years, maybe. Maybe it's a... Uh, Maybe, yeah, maybe 10 years. Let's call it 10 years. Um, what's the word for it? I guess, uh, do, 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 do. Oh, gosh, I can't remember. But there's an exact phrase that people used to use to describe Barack Obama, and it's the same principle that's happening with Donald Trump. So there's, back when Obama was either running for office or, or, while he was in office, they used to say that he was some version of a terrorist or something like that, or part of some terrorist group because his middle name is Hussein. And basically, because of things like CDA, etc., it's kind of dumbing down our discourse where everything's so uncritical and unthoughtful and all oppressor, oppressee, you versus me, tribal, that now it's okay for people to say, something like Obama is a terrorist and Trump is a racist. Neither of those statements, from what I can tell at least, and maybe I'm just terribly ignorant and uninformed, but neither of those statements seem to be true. Neither person, from what I can tell, has said or made any overtures about either of those things. So, but that's the end result of creating a society that looks at everything through the lens of oppressor, oppressee, oppressor, victim, of this power disparity, you, your basic identity variables, you are scary to me because of your basic identity variables. That's what CDA leaves us with. And sadly, I think this might even be pushing us towards something like a civil war. And I hate to sound like a weird conspiracy nut guy because I'm not that guy. Um, but maybe it's, it's that time. And I'd hate to see that because I don't think we need to do that. I think we're smart enough that we don't need to do that anymore. But maybe not. I don't know. So, you know, again, what can we do? Like, what can we do to kind of wade our way through all this insanity to maybe, I don't know, maybe not have to freak out and live through the lens of oppressor, oppressee, oppressor, victim? Well, first thing I would think about, if I were you, is if you're a parent, or if you're a future college student, I would have lots and lots and lots of discussion with your kids or with yourself and with your friends about your desire to go to college. Because right now, A, there's just this stupid debt crisis, which I'm a part of, so I can I have a personal bias, um, which I don't know if you need debt to have a successful life. Um, B, uh, I would explore the job market so if you really need college to get the job you want to get, cool. If you don't, screw it, right? I teach at a college. I get this. Uh, I'm not trying to say don't go to college. I'm just trying to say be very thoughtful. I'd be very thoughtful about the type of school. So like Evergreen, for instance, that sounds like just a nightmare of a place to go. There's minimal free speech. There's minimal actual critical thinking. There's a lot of the CDA-infused like oppressor, oppressy insanity. And there's just this strong presence of social justice warrior and Antifa morons up there that are just like causing all sorts of hell. By the way, I know I've been called out a number of times by people who are close to me. Um, when I say the phrase Antifa morons, and I want to clarify as best as I can for people. So I understand that that's a very harsh sounding thing that I say. 
And I'm actually just using a word that has a slightly incendiary value to actually describe a technical problem. So back to IQ, back in the day, back in the 19 teens and, and around that area, professionals, academics, used to use the word moron, imbecile, and idiot, those three different words, to describe different levels of intellectual deficit. And moron used to mean something like between 51 and 70 IQ, which is low. So the average, theoretically speaking, if you believe in it, unless you're Nassim Tlaib, um, is about 100. And then the standard deviation is about 15. So two standard deviations below would be like a serious like intellectual deficit. So 51 to 70 would mean you're kind of a very primitive Neanderthal-like person. And then if you're an imbecile, you're almost a vegetable. And if you're an idiot, you're basically a vegetable who needs to be caretaken for the rest of your life. So at the Neanderthal level of intellectual functioning, what we used to call morons, that's exactly how, you know, Antifa is acting. Black Lives Matter is acting, the KKK, left or right, right? So I see them as comparable, the Antifa people and the KKK, Black Lives Matter and whatever your other conservative or right side of the aisle oppressor hate group is. They're the same in my mind. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not thinking about it very thoughtfully. They seem the same. I see both groups, black or white, gay or straight, orange or brown or purple or green or whatever. I see them all as morons. And the reason they're morons, again, 51 to 70 IQ, is simple. They're not using critical thinking skills. They're overly aggressive, like stupid people typically are. They're reactionary, like stupid people typically are. And that's a problem. Because the problem is these people who are participating in these very aggressive groups are not actually stupid. I don't see them as literally stupid. I see them as acting stupid. So they're actually undercutting their intelligence by engaging in these very aggressive ways of acting. I love the idea of protest. I love the idea of solidarity. I think if you are part of a quote unquote oppressed group and you see a modern day version of some kind of oppression in the world in which you live, please go let the world know what bad thing has happened. But can we do it in a way that actually makes sense, number one? Number two, that doesn't actually make you look stupid like a moron, where you're just a Neanderthal reactionary thug who wants to fight. And number three, that actually allows people to see your point of view and not be so turned off by you. And the best example of this comes from our buddy Martin Luther King. Sadly, got killed for his views. He was all about the peaceful protest. Why in the world can we not do sit-ins? Right? Why in the world can we not do something like that? Why do we have to be aggressive? It does not make sense to me whether you're a, a white supremacist or a black supremacist, to use a phrase that I borrowed from someone, to use uh, Thomas Sowell's words, if you're a black redneck or a white redneck, why do we have to get so aggressive? Why can we not just like do what Dr. King used to say? Why can we not just have like a sit-in, you know? I think we would actually do better. I think you you would be taken more seriously and not dismissed as trash, as aggressive, stupid trash by people on the left, people on the right, people in the middle. I think people would take you seriously. I would love nothing more than a, uh, and this is going to sound very scary to people, so just bear with me and, and listen carefully. I would love nothing more than a thoughtful protest about issues related to race, sexual orientation, gender, all that good stuff. Go have a sit-in, right? If you think that, you know, Taco Bell, and I'm going to get probably sued for this, but as a theoretical, I have no fucking clue. If you think that Taco Bell is sexist for some reason, then go have a peaceful sit-in, right? That seems like a pretty simple solution. I'm not saying you should boycott Taco Bell, but what if you just had a peaceful sit-in, right? Wouldn't that be a much simpler way of going about it than like yelling at each other? I have a friend who just went to a free speech rally and he got yelled at. For what reason? I don't even know, but he got yelled at, which is just stupid. And that makes no sense to me. Um, so what if we just had like sit-ins? What if we just had like signs and didn't have to yell at each other? Like, 
I've, I've been doing therapy for a minute now. I've been doing a lot of couples therapy too. It seems like when we yell at each other, we don't really accomplish a whole lot. I've never seen that work out well in family therapy or in couples therapy. And I think it's a matter of like, what if we just like thoughtfully walked through the concept of a, a sit-in as opposed to just yelling, screaming, and fighting. I, I randomly run across on mines because that's where I'm predominantly housed nowadays. I randomly run across an article where it's like Antifa started a fight with the Proud Boys and the Proud Boys were engaged in a fight with blah, blah, blah. So Proud Boys versus Antifa, Black Lives Matter versus KKK, whatever it is, right? Like there's all this binary fighting. It's like, why the hell do we have to fight nowadays? We have such a good life comparatively speaking. So that's that's just a little side caveat, uh, tangent, sorry about that. But I just had to clarify, like, we don't need that. We can go back to what Dr. King said. Dr. King was very, very, I think, a thoughtful guy. Um, why don't we go back to that? I support that fully. I support peaceful protest fully. Uh, anyways, if you're an academic, let's try to be more skeptical of CDA, critical discourse analysis, which is ironic because the original somewhat neutral objective of CDA was a healthy skepticism of how we talk. And now we have to be skeptical of our skepticism. That's insane. So maybe academics can move towards what's called uh, positive discourse analysis, which I don't know a whole lot about, so I'm going to own that right now. But if you're an academic in a communications department or a linguistics department or sociology department, maybe we can talk more about PDA and less about CDA. And again, we get it. People on this planet have been doing shitty things to each other, and we've been dominating each other and speaking in a way that we quote-unquote oppress each other. I got it. We all got it. We're aware that we can say stupid, hateful, moronic things. I get it. Everyone I know gets it. We get it. Now, I know that PDA is not necessary. And I'm going to post an article from Hughes in 2010, or no, Bartlett in 2010, and Hughes in 2018 on how you can more kind of thoroughly implement PDA as a corrective measure to the, to the errors of CDA. Um, and I know that PDA, positive discourse analysis, is not the diametrical opposite of critical discourse analysis. So basically, what I, my, my understanding of positive discourse analysis is, is just more focused on how um, the oppressed groups show their power in narratives or, you know, they use count, how they kind of use media and text to counter oppressive social structures. So what if we took more time to use PDA to figure out how to, you know, like get a realistic sense of how people are fighting back and see that because my basic hope is, and I'll be perfectly transparent as I always am. My basic hope is that if we start researching and focusing on how these reactionary movements like Black Lives Matter and Antifa and all of them already have power, then the morons that are in power at universities who teach this crap and the future owners of businesses and the future employees of businesses will get the picture that they're not as under threat. Because if you start to see that you already have a big market share of the discourse, you don't have to worry as much. You've already got people who've got your back. And then you can be less fearful and you can be less reactionary. I'm basically saying that if we use more PDA, we can backdoor in the idea to quote unquote, cool it down as Hughes said in her article. <clears throat> Essentially my point is if we use PDA, we might see that people have more power than they give themselves credit for. That's what I believe. Um, so there's that. And then my third recommendation, so there's a recommendation for college kids and future parents of college kids, et cetera. And then there's a second recommendation for academics, if you're involved in this junk. And then the third recommendation for me is if you're caught up in the oppressor oppressing narrative or the oppressor victim narrative, and you start to think of the world in these terms and you start to see yourself being afraid that you'll be victimized, chill the fuck out. We need to learn how to talk to each other and not talk at each other. And which is ironic because here I am kind of talking at you guys. Um, we need to be able to debate the relative implications of how systems are and were built. And if there are still significant, you know, oppressive, etc., cetera, um, systems that exist, and to what extent do those historical oppressions, et cetera, inform current beliefs, organizations, dynamics, et cetera? And we can't do that if everyone's afraid of either being an oppressor or being in a victim. We just can't do that. So we need to chill out. And in my book, 
this is my fourth recommendation, get the book. I know it's pandery and hacky, but just get the book. There's a lot of good recommendations on how to chill out and have better discourse. Get it. Amazon mascot books. It's worth it. And if you don't get anything out of it, I will send you 15 bucks in the mail. How about that? So this is my little talk on critical discourse analysis. I hope it's been somewhat helpful. Um, And again, let me know. Let me know if I'm off base anywhere. Let me know if I'm mischaracterizing CDA or PDA or anything like that. Because my goal is to just be intellectually honest and see if we can have a more productive conversation. So there's that. And then what else? Let me go through the top chat here and see what's been happening because it looks like there's been a lot going on. Um, Bobby says, please wait after you start the stream to jump right in. Damn you for shaving. Yeah, I know. Um, that's why we're creating amp. Hello, Bob. People talking to each other. Sake Min says, starting with the subjective de definition seems hardly scientific. Well, I think you heard me say that, so maybe you talk about this later in the comments, but it's not my definition. It's their definition. I'll post them, the references in the caption when I'm done here. Uh, did you get my email, Shan? Da, da, da. So com communication between. This is more academic and less Bill Burr. That's funny. I... I love it. If, if people describe me as Bill Burr, that's funny. Uh, that's a compliment, I think. Um, your lips are so red. Who you been kissing? I've been kissing anyone. I'm just dehydrated and I've started drinking water, so the blood's rushing back to them. Let me check. Did you send me one? Da, 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 more email conversation. Musical Element of Life says, yes, this is the most important topic. They organize themselves as ideology and less and less real authentic ideas. Sure, absolutely. CDA and those academics are not, they're being ideological. They're not being academics. They're being preachers and priests. They're not being researchers, which is insane, right? Uh, yeah, got it. Da, da, da. Musical element of life. The problem is the over binary thinking. And they also conclude and include without looking for middle waves. Absolutely. That's one of the critiques that is in some of the articles in the post here. Um, we need to look at the middle because the middle says a lot about where we're at and look, academia is still really important. Uh, we can't lose it. There are people who, if they don't go to college, they are, they will not progress at all for sure. There are tons of people who definitely need to go to college because they're smart or because they have an idea that they want to prove, or they have a theory or they're fascinated by X, Y, and Z, whatever it is they need to go, go for it. I'm down. Now just be thoughtful. Just be very thoughtful and careful about where you go and, Try to not be corrupted by the ideologies that you're walking into. Um, Bobby says, what's funny is how non-binary th thinking thinks it's not binary. It's just another binary box. I'm not quite sure what was said there, but I think it was something profound. Um, thoughtful discussion about modern day superstition. How does that work? That's a good question. Sake, Sake Min said that. I think that's a great question. How do we have a thoughtful discussion about modern superstition? Because it's really a fear-driven thing. Superstitions and all that stuff, prejudices, biases, all in the same category of being very reactionary. Kind of Daniel Kahneman's fast system thinking, not for a slow system thinking. So how do we have a thoughtful discussion? Well, we have to breathe. We have to chill out. We have to go for a run, meditate, get off, whatever it is that helps you chill, and then talk. Right? Get a little oxytocin going. Uh, get a little opiate going. Uh, I didn't say it is non-binary as an absolute. Yes, we are limited as individuals. Yes, we are limited as individuals. That's a great thing to admit. I admit that a lot. Um, we're limited as individuals, but that's the way it is as groups trying to object and discuss and be skeptical, etc. Yeah. We as individuals learn, a musical element says. We learn from our environment and from feedback loops in our brains. Absolutely we do. And the other problem is we have instinctual feedback loops that are more atom automatic and more powerful than maybe our modern discourse is. And that's one thing we don't think about. Then Shannon says, happy Cinco de Mayo, etc." So this has been an interesting chat. I am probably gonna get all sorts of wonderful hate mail and fun, fun things like that. Um, I hope everything I've said makes some kind of sense. Please let me know if it did and if it didn't. Uh, leave as many comments as possible. Like and share, subscribe, buy the book. PatrickLockwoodHealing.com, Amazon, Mascot Books. Find me on Minds.com. I need your help because essentially I'm just trying to help us all, you know, think more clearly, reason more honestly, 
And uh, if you see that I have a bias, let me know. I like when people point out my biases. So yeah, that's my little spiel on critical discourse analysis. And I hope at some point someone who actually studies this will come at me so that um, we can have a chat about it and I can learn more and learn where I'm wrong, learn where I'm right and, and see what happens. But let's try and kind of develop a better dialogue. And I think if we can get to the core of the fact that our academic institutions are starting to spoil the, the soup, uh, we can start to right the wrongs inside the academ academic institutions by maybe focusing on PDA, less on CDA, et cetera. And maybe just like being more skeptical of our critical discourse analysis. So uh, yeah, that's my chat. That's my, those are my thoughts. And I hope they made sense. And maybe I'll be a little more Bill Burr next week. I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. And uh, I will talk to you again soon. Bye.